Good morning, and we'd like to welcome everyone who's here, especially all guests. Just a reminder to fill out the attendance booklet in the middle of your pews. That way we get to know each and one of you extra well. Um, one thing that we are gathering interest on is the sunrise service for Easter. That'll be at the St. Paul's Cemetery. And so if you are interested and willing to come, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex that we would love if you filled out for us. Uh, one other announcement is that the Board of Outreach meeting is at 5.30, not 7.25. So we want to make sure that's clear. And then because of the theme that we're going out, the uh, hope of Easter, uh, doing outreach, at the end of the service we will be giving cards for you to give out to either neighbors, family, or friend to help invite them back to church. If you don't feel comfortable giving a card to anybody, just write it, their name on it and make sure to pray for them. We'll begin the service with the opening hymn.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me upon our sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word announce the grace of God unto all of you and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You destroy those who speak lies. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord be with you. We pray together. O God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. First reading for this, the third Sunday of Lent, comes to us from Ezekiel chapter 33, 7 to 20. Here we see that the Lord is just and that he would turn us away from wickedness and bring us to life to himself. We see he's patient and he has no pleasure in the death of anyone but that all would turn from his way and live. And you'll notice the theme of repentance throughout our readings today. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. 
Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way. The wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us. We rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his way and live, turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the, of the righteous shall not deliver him when he transgresses. And as for wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it when he turns from his wickedness. And the righteous shall not be able to live in his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But in his justice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, yet if he turns from his sin, does what is right, the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live and not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered again. He has done what is just and right, he shall surely live. And yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just, when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is right, he shall live by them. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading, which will be the basis for the message, comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. It starts out by saying that God has really blessed his people many ways in the past. And then he gives a series of warnings, and then it closes with a promise as we face temptation. Promise as we face temptation. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. As with other readings, we see here a call for repentance. There were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 of who fell, uh, on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. 
but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. This time we confess together our common faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The children may come forward at this time for the children's message. What is that? A tree. A tree. Yeah. So Jesus sometimes compares humans to trees. Does that make sense to you right now? No, not quite. It's a little confusing, right? Yeah. Well, Andrew, let's listen and see what we can figure out. Now, what do trees do? Produce. What do we get from trees usually? Air. You said water and plants. Okay. Anything else? What do you think of when I say apple tree? Apples. Yeah. What is that? Fruit. Yeah. App trees produce fruit. Oh, yeah, that's good, Andrew. Now, what is this? What is that? A plant, or could it be a baby tree? Yeah, and so if we want trees to produce fruit, will this produce fruit? No. What's required? It has to grow. We have to... We have to wait. We have to be patient. So, Jesus says that humans are like trees. He has things that he desires out of us. He wants us to love our neighbor, right? We want us to... Yeah. Yeah, he wants us to grow in faith and listen to him. But, does that happen always? No. So God and Jesus are patient. They wait and they wait, but sometimes, will this tree produce any fruit? No, it won't. It looks dead. Now, what happens, what would, ha what would you do with this tree? Would you keep waiting? You would grow it? You would cut it down. If a tree is dead, it gets cut down. If there's no fruit, it gets cut down. But what about this tree? 
It's good. Yeah. So, Jesus wants our life to bear fruit. And he is patient. He gives us time to listen and obey. But, there's one other tree. But it's in here. Can you see a tree anywhere? Hmm. What, what's that? The cross. The cross made of wood. And for us, the cross is the tree of life. Because God was patient and he desired after us. He came to earth to die on the wooden tree. And so he asks us to bear fruit. But for our sake, he died. So let's fold our hands and pray together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for creating us. Thank you for creating us. You desire much of us. You desire much of us. And you wait patiently. And you wait patiently. For our sake, for our sake, you came to earth. You came to earth and died and died on the tree of life on the tree of life the cross the cross help us help us to remember this always to remember this always in your name we pray in your name we pray amen amen, amen. okay before you go back we have the hand out and then we'll be singing the sermon hymn Maybe after the service, Andrew. mercy and peace be to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who helps us and leads us through temptation this is the verse that will serve as a text today 
Verse 13 of our epistle reading. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Sometimes we hear a phrase that we assume uh, that we know its origin and where it comes from, and that gives validity to the particular phrase. If I say, beam me up, Scotty, you would associate that with Star Trek. And yet, do you know that of the 79 episodes of Star Trek and of the six plus movies and the many other Star Trek renditions that have happened, that phrase has never been used. In the movie Casablanca, the phrase, play it again, Sam, is assumed to have been made in that movie. It's close, but it's not exactly the same. It said, play it, Sam, is actually the text there. We do this even with the Bible. We think there are some phrases that sound really biblical. God helps those who help themselves. Boy, that teaches responsibility, right? You can't just wait around. That sounds biblical. It's not. Not in the Bible. And actually, when it comes to salvation, it's just the opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. It's the whole message of the gospel. Today we're going to address a phrase you have probably heard. It's in the common vocabulary uh, in our Christian circles. And that's this phrase. And you may have even found it to be helpful. God will not give you more than you can handle. Sounds biblical. Sort of is. It seems to stem, at least the phrase, from this reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which I read earlier. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but will, with the temptation, he'll provide you a way of escape that you may endure it. The focus here is not so much on the, he will not give you more than you can handle, but the real sense of the text, the real sense of the gospel, the real comfort, the real help, is that he won't give you or bring more in your life than he can handle. One little word, one little pronoun, and it changes everything from you to he. Because I would contend, and I'll give some examples later on, that there are a lot of things in life that's beyond our ability. That's more than we can handle. And the most obvious, we can all say, comes to mind right away, and that is death itself. But it's more than we, he can handle. Now this whole section is a section that speaks about temptation here. And we're going to walk through this a bit. I want to ask you the question today. What is it that tempts you? Now, I bet for each of us it is different. And frankly, at different stages in our life, the temptations change. Maybe it's food that is a temptation for you when you think of the temptation. For some, especially in our one's younger years, it might be pornography. For others, it might be alcohol. Others may be tempted to take liberty with their taxes, what they put down there. It's very common this time of year. But certainly at all stages of life, we are tempted to worry as if God's not there. And I think laziness is not unique to a particular age. It gets us all. We know from the Bible that Jesus himself was tempted. We shouldn't be surprised. He was perfect. He was tempted. We know that from the temptation of Jesus, but also from Hebrews chapter 4, it says these words. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Because he was tempted, he assists us, helps us in our temptation. The verse ends, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Somehow, with Jesus going through this, being tempted, that helps us. That helps us. Indeed, there is nothing in your life, including temptations, that he cannot handle. And the gloriousness of the gospel is even when we fall to temptations, not as an excuse, just the reality, he handles that too. Now, the temptation that underlies all temptation is to lose faith in the Savior. That's the devil, what he wants to do, have us happen in our life. 
And we lose faith in the Savior. We lose the grace and mercy of God. And we heard from our readings today all kinds of warnings concerning that. One might ask, what does falling for temptation, like some of those I listed earlier, have to do with one's faith in Jesus? Can't you be a bit deceptive on your taxes and still believe Jesus? How does one fit with the other? A little pornography? Hey, what do you expect? One's young. I still believe in Jesus. Yet when we think this way, we might also want to ponder this. Would we lie on our taxes or not be fully truthful, filling out the forms right in front of that IRS agent? Would one watch pornography with one's mother and sister in the room? Of course not, because we respect and love them. But somehow we convince ourselves and tell us, in the midst of our temptation, falling for temptation, that the God who knows us, claims us, better than any of these other relatives, anything else, that it's not that big of a deal. On this third Sunday in Lent, we see that Paul is writing the Corinthians out of concern, not just about this particular temptation and this particular one there, but that all of it may result in the loss of faith. And with it, the loss of grace and mercy of the Savior. They, like people of God in the past, and he gives examples of the past and present, were tempted in the realm of idolatry. Not adultery, idolatry, misplaced trust. Which, according to the biblical history of God's people, often leads to various forms of immorality, a deep-seated frustration, rebellion with God. One example is not wanting to listen to what he has to say. And in the process, one looks for other gods that maybe aren't so close to us, maybe aren't so demanding. And so he addresses this concern about idolatry by first of all reminding them what God has done in their lives and in the people's lives in the past. Remember the wonders that God has done. He does that in the first section of of our first Corinthians 10 reading today he talks about how our brothers and fathers wander a cloud and pass through the sea and they were baptized you were baptized and they were baptized through the sea too God was with them and they drank the same spiritual drink just as you're drinking the same spiritual drink they went down to the Red Sea they're no different than you he's done all of these things for you they ate food in the desert you also are given the bread of life as God daily provides for your needs of the body and in the body and blood of Christ in his daily sustenance. His point here is that what other God would do such things for us and rescue us and deliver us from our sins? You're no different, Corinthians, than those people way back then. There is no one that can match the promises and love God has for you. Same God, same gift, same faith. He talks about the God who provided manna in the 40 years and water of the rock, the same God who provides for your daily needs and so on and so forth. And then he comes with this warning. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. Now we ask ourselves, what pleases God? Well, we know from the Bible that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So somehow in this whole process, that trust was put to the side and they were overthrown in the wilderness. They thought God was taking too long on the mountain. And so they made a golden calf, if you remember that. They were impatient, coveted the former life of slavery in Egypt. And so they indulged in all kinds of immorality. And it says in the text, 23,000 people died. That doesn't sound good. And that's the point. What Paul writes is we should not put Christ to the test. He can test us, but we are not to put him to the test. And then he goes on to say that these bad examples, it's still an example, uh, were there for our instruction. I, I said to the seminarians last week, I said, You're, you learn through the process of, of this uh, mentoring process of what not to do as much of what to do. So you learn from the things we don't do well and I don't do well and so forth. So it's the same thing he does here. You learn from the bad examples. Lest anyone thinks he is above all this, take heed lest he fall. That's the warning part. All of this then leads to this really great verse, comforting verse, helpful verse of verse 13. 
And folks, hang on to this verse for all it is worth. First he writes, no temptation has seized you that isn't common to man. As I said earlier, we are not unique. Jesus himself experienced them too. Not so great that Jesus cannot handle them. To the young man struggling with seeing things on the internet you shouldn't be seeing, you're not unique. To the one beating yourselves up because food seemingly has taken over your life, you're not unique. To the one overly consumed with all things money, you are not unique. To those of us who struggle with worry about things we can't control, worry about this, worry about that, as if God isn't in charge, you're not unique. Here then, the next phrase, we're all in this together. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now it sounds kind of similar to, he won't give you more than you can handle. But it seems that that you can handle seems to be the emphasis of that phrase. However, the sense of the word here is that he'll provide you a way of escape, that you're in a battle, and, and there's no way out, and you're cornered, and you're backed up, and you're with your platoon, and all these sort of people, and there's no way out, and somebody yells out, hey, there's a, there's a little ravine, there's a little spot, and only he sees it, and he says, go there. That's the kind of escape he's talking about. He sees that. Who's the one that sees that? The Holy Spirit in Christ. And this is important, because we can't see a way out. There are a lot of things we face, and we will face, and have faced, that are beyond our ability to endure. Let's simply be honest about that. 2 Corinthians 1.8, Paul says that he and his followers face trials far beyond his ability to endure. Psalm 38, the psalmist writes, I am worn out and completely crushed. The whole slant of the scriptures is to give up on self and rely on someone else. To hear that voice that says, there's a spot over there, we can get out, I see it, you can go there. The whole point is, I can't, but you can, and you have, and you will. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.8, We had the sentence of death within us, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. You can do that. He can lead us through whatever. He is faithful. He will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 Hebrews 10.24 says, Let us hold fast to our confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. He will do it. We can't. He can. He has. And he will. He will bear you up amidst your sins. He who has been tempted, he has died. He was raised to life. And well, with all of that, with whatever temptation there is, whatever sin there is in your life, we have a way out. His mercy, His love, His forgiveness. All of that is bigger than your temptation, whatever it is. And it's bigger than your sin. It's bigger than your death. It's bigger than your grief. It's bigger than your depression. It's bigger than your worry. It's bigger than your addiction. He can handle it. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time we rise as the offerings are brought forward.
order and number our days according to your wisdom. Give us repentant hearts, lest we perish in this world of violence and suffering, that we would hold fast to Christ for life and salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but desire that they would turn and live. Give pastors courage to warn of sin and death. Give all Christians strength to defend that message. Turn sinners to life by the proclamation of Christ, who delivers from all unrighteousness. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, guard your people against immorality. Grant that our homes would be havens of godly instruction and chastity, and fill marriages with fidelity and love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of all, you establish justice, not through the desires of sinners, but by your law, which is for all. Enlighten the authorities of this and every nation, that they might rule justly for true good. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, remember your people who cry to you for mercy in a world where towers fall and sinners work evil. Deliver those in need of healing and comfort, especially Eunice, Jerry, Gloria, Francis, Marilyn, Phyllis, Adele, Becky, Sean, Tracy, Paul, Elaine, Chris, Sandra, Wayne, Terry, Kathleen, Dewey, and Jan and strengthen them to look to you for help in their times of affliction. Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer. Almighty God, creator of all that exists, we thank you this day for the births of Sylvie Dawn Monstrantuno and Dashiell Ryan Chickendans. As you have added them to the human family, so also unite them to your holy church through the waters of holy baptism. By the gracious working of your Holy Spirit, help them to grow in your nurture and admonition that they may bring glory to you and serve others in your name through jesus christ our lord lord in your mercy Amen. lord of life we you have brought us into your vineyard and appointed us to bear good fruit receive our thanks for your patience and grant that we would show your love and grace in all that we say and do lord in your mercy Amen. almighty god you led your people israel through the sea and fed them wilderness until you delivered them to the promised land. You have also faithfully enlivened your people with Christ by means of holy baptism and holy communion. Receive our thanks for your kindness to the saints who now rest from their labors and sustain us by your means of grace until you deliver us also to heaven through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has given you an escape from temptation and all your sin, may this strengthen you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and in his joy. give thanks unto the Lord for he is good we give thanks to you almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ your son our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen. the Lord be with you Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn.